then it does some processing of your data and go. And triggers uh, are nothing but again, uh, feed works closely with feeds. Um, it says like, so I tie, it's kind of a uh, tying twain between your action and your uh, feeds. Let's say for this feed, uh, this trigger will be triggered, which will trigger this particular action, right? Uh, so at times, like it's, it's these three terms are pretty bit, bit confusing, uh, but you have to read multiple times to get understood. About rules, um, rules are nothing but like uh, it's again uh, how do I tie my trigger to an action, right? So I get trigger, I have feeds. So how do I tie my trigger to an action? Mean to say like when I trigger something, some action has to be invoked, right? So that's that's where we define rule. Rules could be enabled and disabled. Sometimes if you want to disable some rule, I can go and disable the rule and re-enable the rule. Uh, activation uh, is nothing but your logs uh, of how many how the function was invoked, what's the output of the function, and any error is there. So all these things gets gets come from, from your activation of your functions. Okay. All right. So uh, what are the invocation patterns we have right now? So uh, we have three main invocation patterns. Uh, one is asynchronous. Technically, all functions tend to be asynchronous. Means they have fire and forget. Uh, I don't know what happened. I have to go back and visit my activation log to see what exactly happens. Um, and synchronous, I mean to say I wait for that, the response to come to a typical web kind of an interface, where I wait for the response to come after I invoke a function. Uh, schedule is something like your cron jobs, which gets executed in a specified interval of time. So these are the right of the three main uh, invocation pattern around functions. So how does uh, OpenWhisk work. Right? Uh, so OpenWhisk has uh, these many components, for example, an Nginx uh, front end, so it serves as a REST interface. And then we have a controller, uh, it's a technically which controls everything inside your uh, application. So, and then we have a Kafka engine running, so which schedules the messages to get the action keys invoked. Uh, and we have the CouchDB, uh, which serves as a place where it controls your authentication information, action information, all these things are stored inside a couch. You can technically can imagine like it's the database repository for your uh, open risk thing. And then invokers, uh, invokers are nothing but uh, a Docker engine. Uh, so each node will have one invoker. Uh, each invoker is a Docker container. So for example, for each type of functions we saw, right, for Java, JavaScript, Node.js, Python, Go. So we have one invoker for each type of functions and then this invoker takes care of triggering or starting a new container, a Docker container, which runs your code and then comes out. So so each node will have one invoker. So this is the very high level view of how OpenWisk works. Okay, let's quickly see uh, right, some quick functions um, just to get a feel of it. So as I told you, like, uh, you can go to this place. So. Uh, I have a complete tutorial on that. Though it says as Java fast tutorial, but I have uh, basic basic examples of thing how running. So I'm a Java guy, so kind of wrote Java functions. So you can write in any language you wish. So uh, so what you're going to do quickly is uh, so just going to do this function. So and let's. First, let me see if I have the function. So the very basic command is whisk uh, dash i action list. So this gives you uh, the list of actions that's already there. And the function should be evaluated by the function. Okay. We're using a different instance today, so my talk of demon is pointing somewhere else.
just resetting the environment yesterday. I just changed this from my uh, top yesterday, so just updating it once more. So I just have one action that's good. So uh, so usually uh, so what I've done is like uh, if you see I see so this is an HTTP as you order. So technically when you run this for the first time, uh, so what happens is that we get an unauthenticated certificate errors. So usually to avoid that, since it's my local environment, we need to uh, append a parameter called as dash i. So this is dash dash insecure kind of stuff. So what I did is like I just made analyze for BISC by always equal to dash i. So I don't need to type it every time. Okay. So let's quickly go uh, and then write our first function. Um, I just make this. I just following this so that like just to make sure. I'm going to write a very simple function. Um, yeah. Okay. And that's that's all I need. So I just go there and then say create this action. And you see your action gets created. I'm hiding you. Is it clear? Okay. So what I did is like uh, I went and created an action. If you see, it's not a big uh, file. I just say a simple JSON response that that's given from this uh, function, basically. So uh, I just created this action and then I say, okay, create this action. And he saw that this action was created called as created. Right. Let's verify if it's there. List action list. So now I see that this by default is a JS. Uh, it gets attached to a Node.js runtime by default. Um, and then it's by default, the default package is risk system. So if you want to create a package, then I can attach a package, add it to the package. Okay. So how do I invoke? It's pretty, it's pretty simple to invoke. So this is the synchronous model, which I said. So which means that I have to wait for the response to come. Since it's a very simple function, I say, give me the response with dash dash result, which means that I'll, the, the, the command will wait for the response to come. Just a synchronous mode of invocation. So there you go. So you get you get a response here. So in case if I don't read, so the asynchronous mode is like this. I do this. Once I do this, I get an invocation ID. So and then I have to say whisk activation. I said activation is the uh, the log for all your things. Activation uh, result and then I say the activation ID. Once I say this, I pretty much get the same response. There is also a way by which I can do this risk activation poll. So it's a long running thing, like for usually for a developer environment, you can just have it polling. So that whenever a new action gets invocated, you see the logs on the poll. I mean, right? So it, for example, let's say risk action. Let me copy this. And I say invoke this action. And you'll see this this action got invoked here, and then gives you an activation ID, and then you can just start it. So these are pretty uh, uh, useful stuff. So this this is two different models. I not have any. I don't have an example for scheduled one, but this is how we invoke a uh, uh, asynchronous and synchronous model in this action. So let's get back to uh, what we have here. Okay. So what are Java actions? Um, Java actions are nothing, uh, it's pretty again, uh, it's the same similar action like how we wrote the JavaScript, but it's a traditional Java language, a single class, usually, a Java source, and then it has a different signature for the main method. So we use a JSON object, input a JSON object output as a parameter. So it's a, it's a rule for writing a Java function on uh, OpenBISC. Okay. Uh, so I did a bit of uh, research around two main components. Like we have something called Spring Cloud Functions. Uh, which are the same work, and then the plain old functions, right? The simple Java function, right? So, so the advantages of what I found was like the plain old Java functions were simple Java pojo, single class, and then I have a bunch of methods which I write, um, and it's very simple and straightforward to understand. 
the only problem is that I found where it's not portable across uh, serverless providers. For example, I have to take OpenWisp thing and then go and deploy it on AWS Lambda or Azure functions, right? It's not portable. Um, and then the dependencies needs to be bundled together. For example, if my function depends upon, let's say, three, four jobs, comments lang or comments uh, logging or something like that, then those have to be bundled along. Uh, that's what makes your jar a little bit uh, right. Right now, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the maximum size of an OpenWisp uh, jar is 50 MB. So I cannot have more than that. Right. Um, and then, um, so right now it uses third-party Google JSON for OpenWisp Java action, which means that I'll show an example right now. My method signature has to use uh, the JSON object, uh, Google JSON library for, for the input and output, right, to convert the JSON object. So we uh, at Red Hat, so we are working towards making defining a Java model. So we are kind of saying like how the Java function should be there for OpenWisp. Um, so and on, the, on the contrary, uh, I tried Spring Cloud functions also deploying on, on, on uh, OpenWisp. Uh, and then there are quite a good advantages things here, like uh, it's popular Spring programming model for you. And then it gives you users, supplies, and consumers the, the typical Java 8 uh, language constructs, right? So it, it identifies them. If you annotate them as Spring Beans, then it takes them as functions and deploys them. Uh, and then it has adapters for OpenWisp, AWS, Azure, uh, all this stuff. So it's easy for you to port across. Uh, but there are big disadvantages because I found it really heavy uh, for a function environment because I don't need so many Spring dependencies that comes there, right? Uh, and then also like the startup time is longer. Uh, function should be super fast coming up and down. Uh, but because of these dependencies, what's happening is that uh, it has to wire those dependencies, get those dependencies inside your application while during the runtime. So which is causing it to be very slow. Um, and then it uses some kind of pin jar for dependency resolution as we talked about. Um, customization is not possible uh, because um, see, right now it's open with, I can deploy my own Java runtime, Docker based runtime and then deploy it there. Uh, but with, if you, for example, if you take Azure, uh, I cannot deploy my own uh, Docker image there. So I have to use both of an image, AWS gives me same thing with uh, Azure as well. So that's that's pretty much a bit of a con uh, because for Spring Cloud functions, I have to build my own Docker image and then deploy the Docker image as your own time. Okay. So tooling, um, so there are WISC, which we already saw. It's a default command line interface that we get with Apache OpenWISC, uh, which is used for doing all sort of interaction with the WISC runtime. This deploy uh, is something which they are building right now, so which, which which helps you to define your function deployment as a YAML file, like how you do for a Kubernetes YAML, um, and then we can just deploy the function. You can define packages names and then function names, main class, and all these stuff. It's a YAML manifest, and then it can take the manifest and deploy. Okay. Uh, Maven for Java. So I just pushed one Maven uh, archetype and the Maven tooling sample for Java. So you can just use Maven Architect. That's what you'll be using in our example in a few minutes. So this can be used for Java alone uh, to deploy the thing. Um, and then for serverless framework, uh, uh, there's a framework called how many of you heard of serverless.com? So it's a it's exclusively serverless framework. Uh, so which uses which which is portable, which has framework or templates for multiple providers, Azure, AWS, IBM Functions, and OpenDisk. Right? It, it's based on Node.js. Uh, it gives you templates to create, and then it also has a YAML manifest where we need to fill in some details and you can do deploy it across uh, multiple uh, providers easily. Okay. Uh, so we also pushed here, so it did not have a open with Java uh, template, uh, serverless.com, and we pushed from the app, we pushed for that as well. So now serverless framework also supports open with Java as well. So you can create that template as well. So um, quickly on web action. So this is the most first thing which any developer would like to do. So even if I had deploy a Java function or JavaScript function or any kind of a function, I want to know how do I invoke via web. Meaning to say I have an HTTP URL and I use any kind of uh, HTTP REST verb like get, post, put, delete, anything I want, and then I want to get the invoke. Uh, so for example, what it says is like so it has an URL and then I can also have the content type for virtue of prefixing the URL. Let's say dot JSON then means my content type will be uh, JSON, application slash JSON. If I do dot HTML, then it means that it's, I'm going to get an HTML response from the function. 
Um, and then I can have query parameters, I can have request body as usual with any any function. So what happens is naturally the request body and query parameters will be landing as function parameters. Okay. Um, and I have a content type header I said now, and then it's not <coughs> it's not what you call it. I think it's a typo there. Uh, it's not asynchronous, I mean to say. So which means that I have my result has to be blocked until my response is come back. Um, so sometimes some resources need authentication. Uh, not all functions are open. If a function is a private package, then I need authentication for it as well. Okay. So let's quickly check this. So what I mean by parameters is that uh, if you've seen my old uh, the example which you wrote just a few minutes ago. Uh, so I this this method doesn't have any parameters. So usually technically what I can do is like I can just say like this. Uh, so this params will be a JSON input to your function, right? Whatever key pairs you can give, you can just give key pairs and you can just pass them as parameters as well. We'll see that in example in a moment. So, okay, I'm going shifting back to my notes, the tutorial which I wrote. So, so what I'm going to do is, like I said, I we need this. So right now this. Uh, this Java action archetype, uh, which is a Maven archetype, which is not there in Maven Central. So, uh, is it clear? No. So, so what I have to do is like I have to install it locally. I already have it locally, so I'm not going to do that step. So, what I'm going to do is like uh, go to create a Java project now. So, just say this. Just copy and paste this. So I say Maven archetype generate uh, this particular artifact. And then, example, I'll show you open up the sources in a few seconds. So I just go to create an artifact called as open list. Okay. So we are I'm just working out with open list guys to see this archetype is pushed to Maven Central so that you don't need to install it locally. So it's, all, it's already available like any other Maven archetype. So it's just again. the stuff here. Just go ahead and give the defaults in a task for something, so there's no need to take that. Right. Just going to leave it to defaults. Okay. So, to see this, uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, as I told you earlier, uh, this has one dependency. Uh, so this has this Google JSON dependency which is required because right now OpenWiz mandates that we have to use the classes from JSON for JSON conversions. Okay, so I have to do this and all of the stuff if you see I have used Maven Shade plugin um, to kind of make an Uber jar with all my dependencies bundled inside one single jar uh, and that's pretty much what it has from Chrome perspective. So if you go to your class a very simple class here for this for the sake. So I need to reset my zoom. I think the zoom is. So as I told earlier, so uh, this is this is not a typical uh, Java main main function. So this function is a little bit different. If you see it as a JSON object as a return type, and then it takes a JSON object as arguments. So which means that I, I can pass a JSON or any argument that you pass via this CLI will be converted into JSON and given to it. So, uh, so you don't need to worry about it. All I have to do is like which I want to know which object, which attribute I need to extract inside my class. So in this example, I'm not doing anything very serious here. I just take the JSON object and then I say append a response and then return the JSON back. Okay. So let's go build this and deploy. So what I have to do is like just do this clean package. <coughs> So we are good, and then to deploy is, is awesomely so easy. Uh, I'll explain these parameters in a second. Uh, let's see. Okay. So I say that I create a new action called as hello open whisk, uh, which will have which will take the jar as an input, uh, and then the main class. I have to tell you which main class I have to go and call for this function invocation. 
and I can have multiple classes inside my jar. Uh, I can say which main class I have to invoke. So again, there is a there is again uh, another thing which you are working on to see that it can automatically infer this parameter from manifest file jar manifest. So which is, which is still in a work in progress. So. Okay, uh, I have to just change this one. Let me quickly go. There was a glitch which my archetype, so I have to use this on my uh, artifact ID. Uh, it's, it's just a pojo, that's it. So, uh, so you can have any number of pojo. If you see this, this is a function class. Uh, if you see, uh, it's just a, it's just a pojo. I don't have anything else inside this, right? I can invoke. I can even add dependencies and invoke any other stuff like that. Even if you see the, the small test class which I written here. So I just do a simple invocation like this. That's all. So like how it, it's getting work. So I built a JSON object response. So here I'm building it manually. So if you use Visc CLI. Then with CLI automatically builds those JSON object based on the parameters. So for each parameter you pass, everything will be a JSON app object. So I've rebuilt it. So my target jar, and then you, there you go. So you get the action created. So how do we verify it? This action list, and then since I gave it dot jar. Uh, Wisp will automatically attach a Java runtime to this. So that's what you see here. Java. The previous one we did was Node.js. Right? Um, but what you are seeing about right now is that we are talking about doing a web action. So what I have to technically do for a web action is that it's very simple. So I say web equals true. So this is another command which you are going to learn now. So right now I have a let's invoke it first and then we'll go back to it later, converting that into web action. Uh, so what I'm going to do is like I'm going to invoke synchronously. I just say this result. And you get a response from your uh, uh, how do I convert? So there's a whisk as I told this create, there is also something called a whisk update. Uh, what it mean by this is that Let's say I want to update a function. Let's say I already deployed it. I want to use the same name, but a different artifact has to go, a different main function has to go. I just say update. So once I do this, this function now, I have attached an attribute called as web equal to true, which means that this is now converted into a web function. Right? So uh, what I can do right now is like whisk uh, fli action get. The action name, and then if it says dash dash URL, I'll get a HTTP URL here to this function. Right. So how do I can also do this as well? Uh, summary. Right. Use a summary of uh, my function as well. So these are uh, I have used multiple commands here. First one is that the update command, which means that I'm going and updating back the function. Let's say I change my logic of the function. I already have created the function the same name, just want to go and update it, right? In this case, what I try to do is like I'm annotating that with an extra parameter called as web equal to true, which means that my action has now become a web action, which means that I get an HTTP URL to invoke it. Okay. I can use it's irrespective of it can use any method. There is no method attachment here, which means that it's it's just an URL. I can use get, post, delete, any kind of methods. It's not just you can use only get, I cannot use only post. But there are ways by which I can restrict it. But here in this case, it's not restricted. Um, this action get summary, which gives you a summary of your functions. Let's say if I have defined multiple parameters, then my parameters would be like this. See, there are some ways um, in openness, what we do is let we, we define the parameters, uh, default parameters. I mean to say like, OK, I, let's say I give a name. Let's say an example. The function takes a name. And I say by default, name should always be sent voice. So I can just define that if even if the user doesn't pass it, the centos is a parameter that will be taken inside. Right. So how do I invoke this? It's the invocation is how yeah. There's a few I mean the parameter to the Java method they just create the exception. Right. 
Now this one, no, that's that's a standard signature, right? This parameter is defaults within that. Let's say, for example, I can also have this like a string object. Okay. Okay. Uh, it won't show it. It won't, won't show it. These are this 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 what's shown here is is a default parameters. Oh. What if if I don't pass this args, what will be by default? Right. Oh. There'll be cases where, for example, let's let's simply I'm just changing it for a namesake. Let's say I have string name. Right. And then what if and then I want to use a name here. What if if I don't pa pass this parameter name, what will happen? the value of it. Right? So that I can define when I create a function I can say a parameter default value and then I say this is a value. And automatically if I don't pass the value it takes that value for your function. Okay. Alright so how do I invoke this? Uh, use our code. I don't get, uh, I cannot see the response right here. Uh, I have to go and invoke it from a, I have to say what content time I'm expecting it. So I'll say H, which is another way. Okay. So if you don't specify a content, the, the last time I invoked, I did not specify a content type. So which means that my response, it doesn't know how to return a response to me. So the next time I, I invoke, I, I can say that I need JSON content type. When I prefix .json .xml or whatever you want to do, when you do that, it returns automatic uh, res response in JSON for me. So which is obviously my function is a JSON function, so it's a JSON payload back. So that's the reason why I will fix this. So in other ways, like you can also pass as a header. Um, if you request it, saying that the content type is application slash JSON, then automatically you get a JSON response back. So uh, another super critical stuff which you do always is uh, when I say risk action, I will do this here. So, so this is highly useful when you debug it. We take and invoke the and if I prefix the verb dash b the parameter. So what you see here is that you will see the complete uh, request that happens, right? And this is highly useful uh, in many times because you will be lost seeing like why my action is not returning something, why this is not working. In those cases, it's highly useful that I prefix dash v so that you get the complete JSON output and you can find out what's wrong with that. Right? It gives you the authorization that gets in and then what's your response code, what's your response headers, user agent. So you get all these details which gets passed and what's the content type by default and then set some cookie and know for what this cookie is being set for and then it also gives you an activation ID end of the day. That's a response. The response body is received with an activation ID so which means that I can go and look for the logs. Okay. Uh, so for example if I go take this activation ID and then say we risk activation Result, then I get the result back. Okay. So any any question on uh, action web action? So let's get back to what you were talking earlier. So we can also chain actions, uh, which means that I can have a series of actions to be called in a sequence. Uh, I can say, okay, call action A, action B, action C, and action D. So I can also have these actions to be chained. Uh, that's also a way by which there's also a runtime. So sequence is, is nothing like I have to define it when I define the action, which means that it is static. So I can also have to say action 1, action 2, and action 3, it's static. Whereas in conductors, it's a different type of sequence where your runtime decides which sequence I need to follow. Right? So this is more dynamic in nature. Uh, so there is no input in the sequence, only the first action takes input. Uh, for all other subsequent actions, the output of the first action serves as an input for the other two. Okay. So just like uh, your uh, functions. So let's quickly see this also, training as well. 
So go back to training example. Receive adaption. So what you're going to do is that we're going to create three packages. What I'll order do for, for sake of time, I already have them with me. now so um, the action bonus <coughs> so the sequence demo so I want to go for the so I have three actions and basically one one is a sorter and one is filter and one is an uppercase so what I basically do is let like is pass a comma separated string as a parameter so it goes to the splitter, it splits it down into small chunks of strings and pass it to the uppercase which converts that to uppercase and then finally it gives to the sorter. So this is a sequence which I'm going to see now. Uh, so let's go, I'm just going to go back to my thing. So I'll just see, I'm just going to create. So this is a way, uh, this is something new I'm introducing here is how do I create a package. Uh, just So what I'm going to do now is just create a package. So package is nothing but logical grouping of your functions. Nothing, no big deal is done here. If you want to hide, encapsulate something, you don't want that to be visible temporarily. So if we do then, if we do twist, same thing, F and I, package list, we'll see the package here. So right now it's private by default. So I can also change it to public as well, right, so that everybody knows it. So now I'm going to do is like I already have this splitter uh, function written. So I'm not going to recreate it again. I'm just going to go build it and deploy it. So just going to go to my splitter function and then I just keep the test for time sake. So my function is ready. So I'm going to go deploy it here. My function is updated, then I do the same thing for uppercase. Just package it. I'm not going to use any. So, if you see the difference between the earlier action creation and this action creation, is that so we always suffix this with the package name, see here, which means that it gets into that package. So, if I do the same package list here years and then if I say action list you will see that action is getting inside a package All right so this system red hat developers demo and slash twitter or slash reader so it gets into that way okay so I'm going to create the uppercase function this is also done then I go to the sort action and then I do a build And I just create the sort action as well. All right, so we're good now. So to create a sequence, um, what I basically do is like I create a sequence action. It's again a simple action thing. I just want to be here. I say I create action uh, update with split upper sort. I just rename it like this. And if you see, I'm adding a sequence parameter to this. The sequence parameter, I say, comma separate a list of functions that needs to be invoked. It's typically follow the same order in which you give it. In this case, I'm going to go to splitter, and then after splitter, it goes to uppercase. After uppercase, it's going to go to the sort. Okay. So my action is created. 
So once my action is created, all you have to do is like, let's invoke it. See what happens. So if you see here, I'm just passing a param text. That's what I use inside. So after param, the first parameter after param is the name of the parameter, which is technically we see that it gets as a JSON attribute. So when I'm getting it out, I have to use the name text to get the attribute value. And then I'm just passing a comma separator of string to be sorted. And then I'm going to expect the response. Now. So it means the first time usually it takes a bit of time for Java, next time it will be sorted. Now if we see, I get a result which is sorted now. So which means here, there's a three sequence of actions getting called. Uh, to snow, let's do one thing. So let's quickly activation code. <coughs> So I just want to do an activation code to see the sequence of actions gets invoked. Right, if you see, if you see the activation code, uh, I get the splitter first, and then your uppercase is called, and then your sorter is called. So it's the sequence which we define that I have to go in this sequence. That's how it's being done here as well. And then you get the for this finally the sort split sorter action class where it's kind of collating the response from these three things and giving to you. Okay? So that's about uh, chaining. So it also has, I think we saw about uh, in the Javits, in the theory uh, slide, where we said like, there's an event-driven capabilities of OpenWhisk, so which means that somebody can invoke some event and then the result of the event will be a trigger that causes an action. So that's what we do here. So uh, events could be another function, external event kind of feed provider right now. Uh, it supports GitHub, uh, Slack, uh, and all even you can write your own provider as well which sends an event. So we wrote we wrote one <coughs> provider for uh, InfiniSpan cache. So where we said that any entry you put on InfiniSpan cache, so that gets the event gets triggered via the InfiniSpan listener. The listener will then call a trigger to trigger an event and then to give it to any function that does some action on it. So we did we did it that way. So rules, event action in open is that it notes a trigger. Again, I said that rules ties actions to triggers. Uh, and trigger, there are three types of feeds. Basically, one is polling. Uh, something keeps polling. Uh, and another thing to invoke an action. The other one is a webhook. So this is how GitHub and then Slack all works. So I register a webhook with my function. And then that gets called whenever something happens there. Okay. And persistent connection is what uh, some service, you have to start up a service uh, which keeps running always. Uh, and then it kind of receives an event from the external event source. The moment it receives, it's called the REST API that goes and calls your function. Okay. So this is the uh, pictorial like, representation of how the <coughs> figure it work. So something is running and then it calls your event and then it calls your function. And that's all I have for the day. Okay, so you can just go here to the same demo and then you can just uh, run yourself the demo to see how it actually works. Right? Thank you.